There's plenty of creepy unsolved mysteries in the world, and the music industry has more than its fair share. Rock stars living a life of excess all too often end up dying young. The 27 Club, for instance. Legends of music who all died at the age of 27. And yes, it's true that drugs and alcohol often play a large role in a star's downfall. But sometimes there's more mysterious factors at play when it comes to an artist's death or even their complete disappearance. Plenty of these cases aren't really talked about too often, overshadowed by more infamous unsolved mysteries like Who Shot Tupac or Biggie. But here's a handful of lesser known mysteries in music that remain unsolved. Elliot Smith was a singer-songwriter responsible for recording some truly remarkable and melancholic music. He was even nominated for an Oscar for his song Miss Misery, used in the movie Good Will Hunting. His songs have also been featured in the popular show Rick and Morty. Tragedy struck in late 2003, when Smith's girlfriend came back to his apartment after an argument, only to find him dying. Despite being rushed to the hospital, he was pronounced dead soon after arriving. His death wasn't much of a surprise to anyone. He lived a life of extreme excess after all, and had threatened to kill himself plenty of times in the past. It seemed as if he had actually followed through with it this time. But something about his death was off. When his girlfriend entered the apartment to find him, Smith was standing with his back to her. When he slowly turned to face her, she saw that there was a large knife sticking out of his chest. He had stabbed himself in the heart. Suspicion soon arose. It's not completely unheard of for a person to commit suicide this way, but it's extremely rare. Most would opt for a far less brutal and painless method after all. Still, Smith was an extreme personality, and with that came a tendency to act extremely. It seemed completely plausible to some that this would be the way he'd choose to go, making a statement in a way. But four things make this case suspicious. Firstly, there were no hesitation wounds, cuts to the body, as the individual has an internal battle about whether they really want to go through with the act or not, before finally forcing the blade through. It seems almost impossible for a person to kill themselves in this manner without having any. Also to do with cuts is the fact that Smith's hands appear to be covered in defensive wounds, which occur when a person is trying to prevent somebody else from attacking them. What's more, the blade had been pushed through Smith's shirt. People who do kill themselves in this manner almost always remove their clothing so that they can gauge the right spot between the ribs to plant the knife. And finally, the knife had been shoved into his chest not once, but twice. It seems unlikely that he would have been able to force the blade through a second time. Detectives concluded that his death was suspicious, and that foul play appears to be a strong possibility, though nothing has ever been proved conclusively. Elliot Smith's family is adamant that his girlfriend was the one who stabbed him following the argument. She denies these allegations wholeheartedly. There's a lot of mystery surrounding Jesse Presley, the twin brother of Elvis. Most people aren't even aware that the king had a twin, but don't be too surprised if you didn't either. Jesse died during childbirth. Though over the years, he's become the subject of a number of convincing theories. There are those who believe that Jesse didn't die at all, but was instead sold to a richer family that couldn't have children themselves. Elvis's family was extremely poor after all, and coping with two children may have been impossible for them. There are even books that have been written about the topic, though for the most part, this is all just speculation. More strange is the impact that Elvis's separation from his brother had on him. His entire life, Elvis was consumed by guilt. Many who knew him could tell that he never really came to terms with his brother's death and that he always felt like a part of him was missing. In conversation, Elvis would openly talk about how Jesse would communicate with him as a voice in his head, and even appear in his dreams. 
This is known as the twinless twin phenomenon. To this day, nobody truly knows why it is so universally felt by almost every twin that has lost their sibling, even before they learn they had a twin in the first place. One thing many twinless twins have in common is that they blame themselves for the death of their sibling. Elvis was no different. He would confide in his friends his belief that he killed his brother in the womb, and that it was now his duty to live for the both of them. As such, Jesse is viewed by many as the driving force behind Elvis's music, and the reason he was able to connect with so many people. At the same time, the guilt that Elvis felt over his brother's death is seen as one of the major reasons he spiralled out of control in later life. Had Jesse not been stillborn, would Elvis have self-destructed the way he did? Would the two brothers have gone on to become the twin kings of rock and roll? Would Elvis have even felt such a strong urge to chase the fame that he saw as his destiny, the reason that he survived and Jesse didn't? These questions can't be answered. What is both creepy and heartwarming in equal measure though, is that not long before his death in 1977, Elvis spoke of a dream he had, where he and his brother were reunited, playing a concert together. In his own words, Elvis said, We were dressed alike, wearing identical white jumpsuits, and we were both playing matching guitars slung around our shoulders. There were two blue spotlights, one shining on him, one on me. And I kept looking at him. And man, he was the spitting image of me. I'll tell you something else. Jesse had a way better voice than me. Bobby Fuller was a musician in the 60s, best known for his version of the song, I Fought the Law, which was also later famously covered by The Clash. His music still lives on, but Bobby's life was mysteriously cut short in 1966, just as he was starting to make his mark on the music industry. The 23-year-old's body was found in the driver's seat of his car, just outside his apartment in Hollywood. His face, shoulders, and chest were covered in bruises, and he was doused in gasoline. Even stranger than the state of his corpse was the fact that the LAPD quickly ruled his death as a suicide, without even brushing for prints or conducting any interviews. As you can imagine, it's more than just Bobby's friends and relatives who believe he was murdered. His car had been parked outside his apartment for less than 30 minutes before his mother came outside to find him dead, and yet his body was already in an advanced state of rigor mortis, suggesting that he must have died long beforehand. There were also no keys in the ignition. So, who drove his car to the apartment and placed his body in the seat? It's been suggested that the infamous cult leader, Charles Manson, may have ordered the killing, and others have speculated that the Mafia may have put a hit out on Bobby due to his involvement with a woman who had connections to the mob. His brother and fellow band member, Randy, even published a book about Bobby's death, saying he believes that the mob did have Bobby killed after he tried to back out of a deal they had a stake in. Were the cops paid off? Too scared to interfere with the real culprits, or did they possibly have a hand in Bobby's death themselves? We'll probably never know. Richie Edwards, one of the members of the Welsh band Manic Street Preachers. He's regarded as one of rock's greatest lyricists, having penned some of the most poetic and politically charged words ever put to music. At a young age, his band had found success, and Ritchie had achieved both fame and fortune. The band's future, and his, was full of promise. And yet, in 1995, at that fateful age of 27, Ritchie mysteriously disappeared, and has never been heard from since. So what happened to him? On the 1st of February, 1995, Richie was scheduled to catch a flight to the US for a promotional tour, but he intentionally never made the flight. Instead, he checked out of his hotel in London at 7am, and reports say that he got into his car and drove all the way to Cardiff, Wales. Not much is conclusively known about what happened next. 
Ritchie suffered from depression and was known to self-harm. For instance, in 1991, after arguing with a journalist from NME about the values and seriousness of the band, Ritchie carved the words for real into his arm with a razor blade. After not being heard from, it started to appear as if Ritchie had committed suicide. His car was found abandoned nearby the Severn Bridge just over two weeks after he disappeared. It showed signs of having been lived in. But that doesn't explain the mysterious events that occurred before and after he vanished. What's strange is that Ritchie had withdrawn £2,800 from his bank account just before disappearing. Why would a man who planned on killing himself take out so much money beforehand? The theory that he's still alive is backed up by a number of reported sightings of him as well. Only a couple of weeks after Ritchie disappeared, he was spotted at a passport office. A taxi driver also claims to have picked him up and dropped him off in South Gloucestershire. In the years after he vanished, there have been multiple reported sightings of him in the Canary Islands. What's more, the investigation into Ritchie's disappearance has been described as far from satisfactory. Ritchie was tiring of stardom. The lifestyle was too much for him, prompting him to turn to alcohol as a coping mechanism, which, in turn, led to him being admitted to a psychiatric hospital in 1994. Only the day before he vanished, he called up his mother, telling her that he didn't want to catch the plane to the US. Did Ritchie really kill himself, or simply fake his own death to escape the rock star lifestyle that was starting to take its toll on him? Well, no one really knows for certain. Either way, in 2008, after having been missing for so many years, Ritchie was declared legally dead, despite no body ever being found. Peter Ivers was an alternative musician known for writing some truly eerie music, such as In Heaven, an extremely creepy song featured in one of the most unsettling movies ever made, A Razorhead. Even more horrific, however, is the way that he died. The 36-year-old was found in his Hollywood apartment, bludgeoned to death in his bed with a hammer. There were no signs of a struggle. Somebody invaded his home in the middle of the night and ended his life as he slept. Ivers was well liked and had many celebrity friends and connections in the Hollywood area. When news of his death spread, his apartment was flooded with mourners who came to pay their respects. Unfortunately, his popularity would become the reason his murder was never solved. The police failed to secure the crime scene due to the huge number of friends and fans who arrived at the apartment. As a result, it suspected that crucial evidence that could have helped solve the crime may have been destroyed or compromised. Ivers was likely killed during a robbery, though why the criminal felt the need to kill him remains unknown, since Ivers appears to have slept through the entire ordeal. His murder remains unsolved to this day, and, due to lack of evidence, that's unlikely to change. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. If you want to hear any of the songs I talked about in this video, I've left some links in the description for you, because obviously for copyright reasons I can't actually use them in the video. Not without getting the proper licensing, etc. Yeah, 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 you get it. But yeah, definitely check out some Elliot Smith because some of his stuff is just really great and is really worth your time. As always, don't forget to smash that like button or I'll smash you. And I'll have another story video for you guys very soon. So until then, stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.